Good morning. morning. Welcome everybody to worship this morning. Uh, A few quick announcements before we get started. Um, If you look in your bulletin, today is meeting Sunday. The deacons will meet following worship, circle after Sunday school outreach at 3. We'll have Kingdom Kids this afternoon at 4. If you look in your bulletin, uh, there is a church contact card. Now, I know the majority of you here are already members, but it's good at the start of every new year to make sure I have all your information correct. Some people have moved, some people's numbers have changed. So if you get an opportunity, please fill this out and return it to us, whether you put it in the plate, whether you give it to me, or you put it at the back by the the door. Uh, Please get those back as soon as you can. I'd like to update the list to make sure all the information is correct. Um, Also, offering envelopes are still back in the vestibule, as well as giving statements for last year. I know you'll need them for your taxes. So if you need them, they are out back. And please thank Frances. She did a lot of hard work to get those things together. Uh, And then, um, obviously, if you haven't started a Bible reading plan, start one. (laughs) If you need uh, suggestions, let me know. And there are a couple of announcements that are not in the bulletin. Uh, We need a little more help with the kids on Sunday morning. Uh, We have plenty of people that have volunteered, but sometimes, like when sickness and holidays come like we've had, Uh, we find that we need a little more help when people aren't able to be here. So if you are able, please let me know. We can put you on the backup list. Um, Let's see. Oh, and also uh, one last thing. Uh, As of this morning, the session is met. We will have Bible study on Wednesday night this week. Uh, At 6 o'clock downstairs, uh, we will start back again our look at the book of Revelation. And so uh, all that to say, That is all the announcements we have here today. So we should be gathered together to worship God. Let us now be called to worship from Psalm 33, verses 1 through 3. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before you again here today and we recognize that you are almighty. You are all-powerful. You are all-knowing. Lord, you are the Alpha, the Omega, the all in all. And Lord, we come and we honor you here today. Lord, for you deserve our praise. You deserve to be glorified. And Lord, in this time, we pray that all we would do here this morning would be for that purpose. Lord, as we come before your throne of grace and prayer, Lord, as we open your word and hear it preached, Lord, as we sing your praises here this morning, Lord, may it all be focused upon you. Help us to put aside any distractions, any other plans, or anything else that is going on, and may this be a time that we spend together with you, giving you the worship you deserve. And so, Lord, may you bless this worship, may you work in us in this worship, and above all, may your name be praised. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number 358, God of Grace, God of Glory. Let's stand together. Shame our wanton. 
unselfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Set our feet on lofty places, gird our lives that they may be armored with all glad like graces in the fight to set men free. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage that we fail not men who pray. Our gracious God, who is the giver of all good gifts, the one who provides and cares for us and sustains us each and every day, Lord, we come before you here this morning, giving back a portion of what you have provided. Lord, we give these tithes and these offerings for you, for your glory, for your church, and for our good. And Lord, here today we pray that you would take them, that you would use them, Lord, that your name would be praised. Help give us wisdom and how to disperse them. And above all, remind us that it is you who are in control. You that will care for us and you that will continue to provide even in the worst moments. And so, Lord, may we trust you here today as we give back to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. May you be seated. We come again this morning and confess the God that we believe in. So I ask you, Christians, in whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. Hear now God's word. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the, Lord, the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins. And half the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. God's word for God's people. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we come again before you here today. We come because we know that you are a God that hears us. For you are a God that has been gracious to us through your son Christ who has taken sinners like us and made us your children. Brought us into your family so that we can come to you with full confidence in knowing that you hear us. Knowing that you answer us and knowing we can trust in your answer whatever that might be. But Lord you are a mighty God who is able to do all things, a God that we can come to with everything. So often we look at our lives and we see that there are moments when we feel helpless. We feel like we cannot go any longer. We feel like we are unable to do this or to do that. We are unable to overcome this sickness. And yet, Lord, we come to you because we know you are a God that can do the impossible. You can do what we cannot, and so we trust in you. And we come and we lay these problems at your feet, problems of sickness, problems of anxiety and stress, problems of grief and doubt. Lord, we come and we lay all these at your feet. For all of us here this morning, we are struggling with something. And Lord, we come and we bring these to you. And we know that you are also a God that is involved in this world, a God that continues to play a part in all things. And so, Lord, we come to you and we pray for our nation. For, Lord, it is very clear we are a nation under judgment. For, Lord, we have strayed far, far, far from you. And, Lord, I pray that we would see revival. I pray that you would work in our nation, work in our leaders. Lord, where they may have been leading us far from you, Lord, may you turn them towards you. Lord, to lead in a manner which is honoring to you. And if not, Lord, may you remove them. And Lord, may you replace them with somebody that loves you and honors you as they should. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to work through us as your church. Lord, we are weak, we are broken, and yet you can use what is weak and broken to shame the proud and the strong. And so, Lord, may you use us, Lord, to make an impact to the world around us. May you use us to share the gospel. And Lord, may your spirit use our words and our actions, Lord, to change hearts and minds. Lord, we would see people come to Jesus more and more. So we would see our nation transformed back to what you would want it to be. And Lord, we come to you with other requests. Lord, we thank you for the many first responders. Lord, we thank you for the EMTs. We thank you for the firefighters. We thank you for the policemen that you have called to go and to care for us in these different ways. And Lord, we pray for their protection. We pray that you would guide them and Give them strength in what they have to go through. Lord, we thank you for the doctors and the nurses, those that you have given the gift of healing. Lord, we pray that all they would do would be for your glory. And Lord, we pray that you would guide their hands. Lord, that you would use their gifts to heal and to help. 
And Lord, we thank you that you are a God that works in each and every one of our lives, whether we might be a pastor, whether we might be a teacher, whether we might be someone that works in a business, a student, whoever it is, you are a God that cares for us. You are a God that provides. And so, Lord, we come to you with the many different things that we are going through, and we know that we can trust in you and lean on you and know you will provide and take care of us, whatever that might look like. And so, Lord, as those that have come from many different backgrounds here today, many different situations, we now take a moment to focus upon these things and to offer them to you in a moment of silent prayer. And we come before you, Lord, knowing that when we are unsure of what to pray, we can always pray the prayer you taught your disciples praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite everyone to stand together. Our second hymn this morning is number 437 in the church's one foundation. be seated.
you had both Ben Pratt and Alan Kamenowski come to us. Um, based on here this morning, uh, we are reminded of how God has organized his church. God has given us elders and that's the elders. And he has given us deacons, each to serve in different ways. Elders to care for the congregation in the spiritual life and deacons to care for the finances, for the widows, for the drowned, amongst other things. And here this morning, you have elected both Beth and Alan to come to be deacons here. And so this morning, we turn now to both ordain and install them. Now, Alan has served as a deacon before, and so Beth, we come to you with these first two questions as you respond. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you confess and believe the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, and acknowledge him head over all things for the church, which is his body? Do you reaffirm your belief in the Bible? Scriptures of the Old and New Testament as the word of the living God, the only perfect rule of faith and practice, infallible in all of its uses, and where in the original manuscript, which nothing is to be added, and from which nothing is to be taken away at any time or upon any pretext. Do you accept the doctrines of this church contained in the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechism as found in the Word of God and as the expression of your own faith? And do you resolve to adhere to them? Do you accept the government? discipline and worship of the associate the foreign soldiers here in England. Do you accept and denounce the Do you accept the office of deacon in this congregation, and do you promise to perform faithfully all the duties of the office, and do you promise to endeavor by the grace of God to live your life in Christian witness before the church and in the world? Do you promise to submit in the sphere of love to the authority of the session and to the higher force of the church? And do you promise in all things to promote the unity, peace, purity, and prosperity of the church? As they come here today as officers, there's a question that is asked of all the congregants here this morning. As so, do you stand on your firm? Do you, the members of this congregation, acknowledge and receive these fellow members as deacons, and do you promise to give them all the honor, encouragement, and assistance in the spirit of love to which they offer according to the word of God and the standards of this church and Palestine. Again, if you would stand on your phone. And I'll have officers come forward. Justice Stevens, come up here and you will speak to me. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come before you and we thank you many people over many centuries to serve in the church. Lord, we thank you that you have called those with the gift to come and to use them for your glory. And Lord, here today we come and we thank you that you have called these people. Lord, we thank you for Beth and we pray that you would use her and her gift, that you, you would set her aside for this office, that you would bless her, that you would use her in the full, fullness of her ability to honor you and glorify you in this office. Lord, we also thank you for Alan. And Lord, we pray that you will continue as you have used him before to use him again. Give him the discernment and the understanding to know what comes with this office, to use his gift diligently and to both of them, Lord, we pray that you would bless us, bless them, and above all, your name would be blessed. We pray these more things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great head of the church, I now declare you duty ordained and installed in the sacred office of deacon. The right hand of those who do. And if you care, if you come forward to your children. Yeah. 
Y'all, y'all want to be sober too, right? No, it says it snows and you get out of school. You want to get sober tonight. You go outside and kill some people. And I'm not listening to y'all. <laughs> You're supposed to not have to go outside and kill some people. You have to prepare properly. Now, what are some things that you need to prepare for by putting on your outfit? You want me to stop asking Eleanor questions? <laughs> I invite everybody, uh, our scripture passage today, it comes to the book of 1 Peter. We're looking at chapter 1, particularly verses 1 and 2. And here this morning, uh, we are starting a walk through a new Bible book. And this letter is written by the Apostle Peter. 
Uh, he is writing to churches who are across modern-day Turkey. He writes it around 64 to 68 A.D., and this is a letter that is very rich in many different things uh, to encourage us, to help us, and to equip us as Christians. Before we see what he writes, may we go to God in prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have carried along these men over the years to write down the words on the page that you want us to hear. And Lord, we thank you for working in Peter to give us these words here today. And Lord, we pray that you would also work in us, open our hearts, open our minds to understand these truths, to see how they apply to us, and Lord, to love them, to cherish them, and to live them, and Lord, to grow closer to you by them. And so, Lord, now I pray that you be with me in spite of my brokenness and my sin. Lord, may your spirit move and bless these people and glorify you here today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, hear now God's word. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. As a pastor, I need books. If you have ever walked by my office with the door open, you see I have plenty of them. And part of the reason is that in order to properly prepare for a sermon, for a Sunday school lesson, or, or simply just to be able to answer questions and help guide people, I need to be familiar with God's Word. And so what I need is I need to find books to help me do that. And especially now. You know, we are starting a new book, and so I found myself, I had to go find some good books to help me in this study of 1 Peter. And often what I tend to do is I go to Amazon or somewhere online, very easy place to find what you're looking for and order it. But other times I tend to sometimes just drop by a bookstore to see if they might have anything. Now, nine times out of ten, they don't. Uh, they typically don't carry what I'm looking for at places like Books A Million or Barnes and Noble, but I'll pop my head near anyway and see. And I'll go back to the session, sections labeled Christian, and often I'll find that there's not what I'm looking for. But what I've noticed is when I go in there, and I'll tend to look around to see what else they have. And if you've ever been in one of those bookstores, you know they have different sections. You have a fiction section. You have a children's section. You have a biography section. And one of the things I've noticed over the past few years is there's a certain section that continues to grow, the how-to section. How many of you have ever seen an idiot's guide or something for dummies? Those two different, one's orange, one's yellow, to learn how to do something. There are so many how-to books out there, and I think many of them are for a good reason. If you want to learn something, it's very helpful. If you want to learn how to garden, if you want to learn how to knit, how to do woodworking, how to do carpentry, if you want to learn how to save money better, how to eat better, there are books out the wazoo. And chances are, if you are looking how to do something, if you were to go into that store, look on the, in that section, you'll probably find something that will help you. But, not always. I think there are sometimes how-to questions we ask that sometimes a how-to book won't help us with. That a book from a bookstore won't help us with at all. I think there are some questions, but one question in particular comes to mind here with our passage this morning. Is how to be a Christian, a faithful Christian in a fallen world, and how to deal with suffering because of your faith. I guarantee you, if you were to go in to Books a Million and Rock Hill and look for a book in the how-to section on that, you're probably not going to find it. But if you go to another section, you will find a book. If you go to the Christian section, they have Bibles. And that's a book that can help you answer that question. And in particular, the Bible as a whole, but really here in the letter of 1 Peter is a wonderful place, a wonderful book that is written to help us with that question. Because you see in this letter, Peter, he is writing to Christians that are suffering for their faith. 
Christians who don't know what to do, who have probably fallen into despair. And he writes to them to encourage them and show them how they can deal with these things. And he does so by showing them that they need to focus not on the world, not on their problems, not on their suffering, but on their relationship with God first and foremost. And it will help get them through whatever else is going on. And what he does is he writes them this letter to encourage them. Look, have hope in Christ in the face of the world. And also in helping us to live a holy life while we do it. As we walk through this book over the next few months, time and time again, Peter is going to show us how to do these things. How to live faithfully as a Christian. How to live in a way that honors God even when we are suffering. And he starts right here at the beginning. You would think that, oh, he would take a second to just say hello. No, and even in these first two verses, in the greetings to this book, Peter wasted no time in showing us these truths by helping to ground us in our relationship with God. And what he does here is in order to help us who are suffering, is he wants us to remember three different things when we are suffering. Remember where you come from. Remember whose you are. And finally, to remember what you have been given. So you can find hope in the Lord even when you are suffering. And so he begins here by first telling us, remember where you come from. Look at verse number one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now typically, when you and I were to write a letter, we would write our name at the bottom. We would put the recipients at the top, but you have to get to the very end, and we sign our name. But as was custom in those days, what people would do is they would write their name first. And then they would write the recipients, and then they would go into the letter. And that's what we see is happening here. We're told that it is Peter who has written this letter. And this Peter is none other than the Apostle Peter, who Jesus himself has called into ministry to go and to share the gospel. And who is he writing to? Well, we're also told that. We're told he's writing uh, to the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And if you don't know where those are, essentially these are all churches that are found in modern-day Turkey. Now, Peter has probably not met the people in these churches, but yet he's still writing to them. And the reason why he is writing is because he has heard the situation that they found themselves in. He's heard of their difficulties and their suffering for being Christians. And that's why we see he calls them in the beginning here. Exile, elect exiles of the dispersion. Now when you hear that phrase, if you know your Bible, your mind goes back to do different things. You hear the word exile, you cannot help but think of the exiles into Babylon. You go back to the Old Testament, the people of Israel, they disobeyed God. And so he sent them into exile in Babylon, away from their home. But then even after that, there were some that went back, but some that did not go home. Those were called the diaspora, the dispersion. If you go to books like Esther, we see that. People that did not return back home, that were still out in exile. And so when we read this, people, Peter is making a connection between those people and the people here. Now, these people that Peter's writing to, they may or may not be Jewish Christians. But he calls them exiles for similar reasons. Because they are living in a place that is not their home. And the reason for that is, if you think about when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, all of us have an address change. Our home go goes from being here on earth to being in heaven. As we see the old hymn reminds us, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through, if you have heard it. And we're reminded that even if we are living in the same place we have lived all of our lives, when we come to Jesus, even that place is not our home anymore. Your hometown may be York, South Carolina. It may be Rock Hill, or wherever you come from. But the truth is, is that when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you now have a new home. You now have a new address. And because of that, you are now considered to be foreigners and exiles in this current world. And the reason for that is in the word exile itself. See, that word is often used in Peter's day to describe somebody that does not hold citizenship, somebody that everybody else sees as a foreigner who has no rights, 
no privileges, and no responsibilities as a citizen. A person who has different values than the culture that they live in. And often, that's why foreigners will be looked at with mistrust, with hatred, and seen as a possible threat. Sound familiar to today at all? And even these people that have maybe grown up where they're still living, Peter is writing and saying, look, you're foreigners now. You are exiles wherever you might be. You now have a new life. You have a new address. You now have new values. And those values are probably going to come into conflict with the values dominant in society. And you're going to suffer for it. And so do we. You and I are exiles in this world as believers. And that's why Peter is writing here to remind us, look where you, remember where you come from. You need to live in a manner that is consistent with where your home is. And people need to see it. I remember there was uh, last year, we were up at Bon Clark and we were having a, a missions festival. And as most of you know, I'm an assistant director to one of our mission trips for high schoolers. And so I was talking to different people about it. And there was one lady who came up to me. She and I were talking. And after we were done, she was like, you're from upstate South Carolina, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. She apparently was from Somerville, from low state South Carolina. I didn't know I had an accent, at least from everybody else around here. But apparently it stood out. I did. And maybe you yourself, when you have gone somewhere, you're the one with the accent. Or maybe there's somebody that you meet, you're like, you're not around from around here, are you? And the truth is, is as Christians, that should be the same way. Not necessarily in the accent we have, but in the words we say, in the lives we live. We need to be living in a way that people realize, oh, we're, this world is not our home. We have a different address, one that is found in heaven. But this is not simply just reminding us how we ought to live. Peter is writing this again to encourage us. He's reminding us, look, you're in exile. And that might sound bad, but that actually is a wonderful thing. Because it's very easy to despair when you're treated poorly, whenever you're struggling, whenever you're suffering. But when we're reminded we're in exile, we're reminded that one day we won't be going through all these things anymore. Because we have a new home. And that thought of home should comfort us. I mean, if you just stop and think about your own home for a second. You go to work all day. You work hard. You're tired. And when you are done, you're ready to go where? Home. Or you're, you're out running errands all day. And by the time you're finished, home is where you want to be. Even if you go on vacation, I think there comes a point for many of us when we are tired of vacation, and where do we want to be? Home. Because there is no place like home. Because there's a comfort in it, right? In having your own bed, your own couch, being able to set the thermostat on what you want to set it on. And being able to have the type of food you want in the refrigerator. And so much more. There is no place like home. There's a comfort to it. And that's why I think when we are often out somewhere doing something, we watch the clock and we're ready to get back there just a little bit longer. And that's what Peter is trying to help us to see, is we are in a place that is not our home, but we still have a home to look forward to. We might have to wait a little bit longer. We might have to suffer more. But the truth is, is that this is not our final stop. Yes, we are exiles and foreigners now, and it's not going to be easy. But yet you have a home in heaven that has been secured for Christ waiting for you. And that's why when life gets hard, we remember this is not our home. Remember where we come from, where our home address is now. Because right now we're pilgrims. There will come a day when we will be home for good. And what a comforting feeling that will be. But that's not the only comfort Peter gives. After reminding us, helping us remember where we come from, Peter also then tells us, remember whose you are. You are the Lord's. And he says that in verse number 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. When you and I were suffering, were struggling, were being made fun of, looked down upon, even threatened and condemned for our faith, he tells us, look, remember whose that you are. You are the Lord's. And he describes God here to show that. First, he talks about how we are elect exiles. Yes, we might be foreigners, but we have been chosen by God to be his people. 
And Peter goes, wants us to understand that he has chosen us to be his people. He first talks about God the Father. He says, you've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. What he's saying is, look, you haven't been saved because you reached out to a distant God. No, but this God stooped down and formed you into his people before the creation of the world. He chose you to be his. Now, I know election is a hard topic for some people, but whatever your thought is on that, whatever side you find yourself on, the point that Peter's trying to make is, look, we in the church are not in the church because of our own decision, but because of the initiative of our God who has called us, who has worked in our lives before we even knew it. He chose you. And that's an encouragement because we look at ourselves, we see our brokenness, we see our shortcomings, and yet God still chose us to be his people. And we're also encouraged that the God that chose us is a God who is our Father. We're reminded that we are His children if we have believed, that we have a relationship with Him, that He is a God that cares for us wherever we might be. He gives us hope, whatever we might be going through. But if that's not enough, Peter doesn't stop there. He now moves on to the Holy Spirit. He says the Holy Spirit, who is the one that we are sanctified by. Now, if you look at the word sanctification in the Bible, it's one of those Bible words uh, that's used, and it means to be holy, the process of being made more holy. And often we see that it's talking about how you and I are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We are made more and more like Jesus. We are able to put off our sin more and more as each day goes by. But here, this word for sanctification, this is talking about how the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts when we come to faith how we have been sanctified, how we have been set apart to be God's people. That he has worked in us, bringing us to faith so that we will be born again. Again, you see God working in us, broken sinners. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives and he doesn't simply just clean up our old life. He gives us a brand new one. And again, this is a reminder of how we ought to live, but also an encouragement because We have a God who has chosen us and a God who has worked in us to set us apart to be his own. And then after this, Peter then points us to Jesus himself. That you and I, we have been set apart for obedience to Christ and for the sprinkling of his blood. Now again, you and I, we are to obey Jesus in all of our life and all that we are do and all that we do. But this is really focusing on the obedience we have when we first believe the gospel. When we first put our trust in Christ. You see, the Holy Spirit, God chooses, the Holy Spirit works in us, and the Spirit shows us we are not good enough. We can by no means save ourselves, no matter how many good things we do. And because of that, we see we need Jesus as our Savior. And because of that, we then put our complete trust in Jesus, seeking to obey Him in all that we do, right then and there at the beginning. Now that makes sense. When we come to faith, we say that we're going to obey Jesus. We are going to follow him fully. But then you get this part about sprinkling with blood. There's actually a connection here. It it and obedience are connected. If you go back to the first scripture lesson we read, we see that. There you have Israel there at Mount Sinai. God had delivered them from Egypt. And they are entering into a covenant with him. And they have promised that they will obey God. And so what happens is an altar is erected, 12 pillars are put up, sacrifices are given, and then again, they promise they are going to obey and follow God. And in this covenant, God will be their God, they will be his people. They say they will obey, and then they are then sprinkled by his blood. That blood of the covenant is sprinkled upon them. See, there's a connection between obedience and this blood, not just with them but with Jesus. And that's what 1 Peter is reminding us here. He's reminding us of ourselves and Christ. God, yes, he's chosen us. He's worked in us by his spirit. And you and I, we pledge to follow him. But there's a problem. We do not follow him like we should. We fall short. We sin. But that's where that blood comes in. Because in Christ, there is that new covenant that all who turn to Jesus will be saved. Because of his blood that has been shed to save us. Christ comes into this world living the life we cannot, obeying perfectly where we cannot. And then he takes on our punishment by shedding his blood so that you and I will be made white as snow. So God has chosen us, the Spirit has worked in us, and Jesus has saved us. So that we would be seen and known as his people. 
That's why Peter's trying to remind us, look, this is where you come from. This is whose you are. Don't forget it. The world might be coming down on you. Remember, you are the Lord's. If any of you have ever seen the movie Toy Story, each of the toys, the owner, Andy, writes his name on them to show they are his. And that was something that the toys in that, in that movie are proud of. And the truth is the same for us. We are the Lord's. And that's something you and I should be proud of too. That's something you and I should be encouraged by, even when everything is going wrong. That he has saved us. He has redeemed us. And even if we might have to suffer, there is an eternal hope that we find in him. But if that summed it up, there's one more thing Peter reminds us here. He also reminds us then to remember what we have been given. We see that in the final part of verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now this is being written to those that Peter's writing. The grace and the peace is to those that Peter is talking to. Those that are chosen, exiles by God, who have come to truly know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Peter says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And that means us if we have come to faith in Christ. We have been given grace and peace. Now we might be tempted to just move on past that. It's as used a lot. Paul uses it a lot. But this is very encouraging for us as Christians. Because in Christ, we've been given grace. Just think about grace for a second. Grace is being given what you don't deserve. It's like if, if your kid goes and they hit their sibling. Instead of giving them a spanking, you give them an ice cream cone. Or in the workplace, you completely botched a job. And instead of getting fired, you get promoted. It makes no sense. And yet it's a huge blessing when you receive it. And when you stop and think about your life, seeing that you have been given God's grace multiplied in Jesus Christ, well, whatever you're going through, that should encourage you. Just think about it. Simply here today, here we are, we are worshiping God. Think about who God is. He's a perfect God. He's a holy God. He's a just God in all of his ways. And you and I are far from that. And this perfect, holy, and just God has every right to wipe you off the map, to condemn you to hell, and be completely justified for it. And yet here we are. Because the same God is the one who has shown us his grace and his mercy. By coming into this world to give us a righteousness, a salvation that we do not deserve, and instead taking on the penalty that we do. That's why we should be encouraged by the grace of Christ. That even when our good works can't cut it, Christ did. As Hebrews 10.10 10 says, that through Christ he came so that we would be sanctified and set apart as God's people. Through the offering of his body once and for all. So that in Christ we find that whatever we're going through, we have been given all we ever need in him. And that's why when we're going through difficult times, when we're treated differently for our faith, when we're ostracized for it, whatever suffering you're going through, when you remember what you have been given in Christ, the grace you have been given, you remind you have all you ever need. Because in Christ, you've been given his grace, which is God's riches at Christ's expense. And that is something that should give you hope wherever you find yourself. But if that's not enough, we're also given peace, as Peter says. If you think about peace, we tend to think about peace as the absence of conflict. Think about peace and quiet with children. You find peace when they're asleep, when they're not arguing with one another, when they're not yelling and screaming very loud or making messes. Or, or you get a sense of peace whenever you get to go on vacation, you get away from the world for a while. But the thing is that that kind of peace always comes to an end at some point. The children are going to wake up. They are going to start getting loud again. They are going to start arguing again. And the messes will continue to happen. Vacation, as much as you wish those vacation days will keep going and going, they end at some point, and you have to go back to reality. But it's the peace that Peter is talking about here, something that's different. This peace is not simply an absence of conflict. No, this peace is shalom, as Hebrew says, as you probably know. It's a sense of wholeness, a sense of contentment that we have been given in Jesus Christ. And this kind of peace where we can have despite our circumstances. You see, the worldly understanding of peace, the worldly version of peace, depends upon your circumstances, where the peace you find in Jesus transcends your circumstances. It's a peace that Philippians tells us surpasses all understanding, a peace that you can have if you are an exile in Peter's day or if you are a Christian in our own day. 
wherever you might find yourself. A peace that you can know that you are the Lord's. That you have a heavenly home in Him. You've been shown the grace of Christ. And nothing can take that away no matter how bad the things are that you're going through. Remember what you've been given. It's far greater than anything that we go through. And that's what Peter's trying to show us here. This this whole book, as we see, it's wonderful. He's trying to show us, look, this is your how-to manual to live as a Christian in this world. And he tells us all that here in these first two verses alone. Look, yes, you are going to suffer. You are in the world. You're not of the world. But ground yourself in your relationship with God. Don't get distracted by all the suffering and pain you're going through. Remember. Remember where you are from. You have a home in heaven. Remember whose you are. You have been chosen and redeemed by God himself. And remember what he has given you, his grace and his peace, that you can have whatever is going on in your life. And if you ground yourself in those truths, then, well, you'll have that peace that surpasses all understanding. You'll have that encouragement even when everything is falling apart. Because we are indeed foreigners in this society. We are going to look different. We are going to live different. And there's going to be consequences for that. But Peter's trying to tell us here, look, you'll be all right. And the reason why is because of the God that you have. The God that has saved you and chosen you. The God that has made a new home for you. And the God that will continue to be with you until you get to that point. So don't give up. Keep going. As he'll continue to tell us, this is just the start of how to live as a Christian in a fallen world. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your grace. We thank you again for the peace. We thank you for the hope that you give us in knowing that we are yours. In knowing that you have chosen us. In knowing that you have saved us and given us a heavenly home. That no matter what difficulties and trials we might face in this world, we can always stand firm upon you. Lord, for all of us here today, may we know that hope ourselves. And if if we don't, Lord, may we come to know it right now and come to faith in Christ. And Lord, if we do know it, may this be a reminder to us of the hope that we have in you. You know, the world is so easy to distract us, to discourage us. But may may this be a reminder that you are with us always, that we are yours. And even if tomorrow everything gets worse, we are reminded that in the end it all gets better. So, Lord, may you encourage us here today, may you equip us here today, and may you give us the hope we need to live for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If everyone to stand together, our final hymn is number 362, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty
again, we're reminded to trust in the gospel and the hope of the Savior that has saved us, that gives us a hope in spite of whatever we might face. May you know that hope today. Receive now the benediction, Lord. In the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Let the peace of God.